We have a speaker this evening, uh, and I'll try to get out of his way as soon as possible. So, um, but I'd like to say something about the Amiga community, which is an Amiga community full of possibilities. Uh, this, this is the most creative group of people that I've ever run into. Uh, and uh, all of you have a stake in this, and everybody has something to contribute here, and has done so. Uh, which is really kind of outside the box as far as computer platforms are concerned. You know, most of those things are, you know, done by huge companies with billions of dollars in resources and, you know, silly marketing and things of that nature. And we don't do that. Uh, it would, would it be nice to have the billions of resources every year. Uh, <laughs> and if any of you have that, please contact us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. We're starting companies, right? But that creative potential is what has been realized, uh, you know, since Commodore went belly up in what 1994. Yeah, uh, and I thought it was kind of a, you know one of the things that I learned about Jens Schoenfeld was, you know, he had the, the guts to actually found a company in 1994, making peripherals for Amigas. The same year the company went bankrupt, which is kind of crazy. Uh, and he's still doing it. So this, this community, this group of people who contributes to this is you know, very, very interesting and very, very unique. Now, I know that's an oxymoron. Unique means very, doesn't it? Yeah, well, I'll try not to go there. Uh, so uh, but we have you know, development that continues. We have you know, new software being written, new hardware being created. Uh, I just bought part of that. I just bought a 600 GS today because I thought it would do what I wanted it to do. <laughs> so this is all very intriguing. And uh, one of the people who's been in the forefront of the intriguing part is our speaker this evening. Now, I know that most of you know him uh, on many levels. And uh, we really appreciate you know, what Trevor Dickinson has done for our community and continues to do for our community. Uh, I know it's not just a hobby with you, it's a passion. And I think it is the same for all of the rest of us. So come talk to us about what an Amiga is in 2021. <laughs> My mind was crazy. <laughs> well, of course. I'm sure that's what you're When Bill asked me to do this presentation, I got the three volumes of volumes of, of vampire, vultures of vampires, and uh, I wrote a really long speech. And I thought well, that's stupid. You, know, you, you don't want to hear a long speech, and we'd like to get to the drinks afterwards. <laughs> But, you know, way back in 2010, I was asked the same question, and I wrote an article for Amiga Future magazine. But uh, I think... <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> back in 2013, I was at, uh, in Calgary, staying with Steve and his family. Uh, I had a mug meeting, the Amiga users of Calgary. And uh, their five-year-old son, Harrison, was drawing. So he drew a rainbow, it's really nice. And he drew a boing ball. I said, Harrison, what's that? And you know, in a reply that only a bright, sarcastic five-year-old could do, he said, it's my dad's Amiga World. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, he's turned into a really nice kid. And uh, he may not have the, the Amiga addiction that his dad had, but at least he knows all about it, right? Yes. right. So we're asking, it was an Amiga in 2004. Uh, shameless plug, right? <laughs> uh, when I was writing, I've done a lot of writing and research on Amigas over the years, and I've written for uh, Amiga Future, Total Amiga and Amiga Future magazine, uh, about uh, one about the history of Commodore's Amigas, what happened to the company after Commodore went bust, about the key people and companies of that, that contributed to the Amiga's success, 
and what happened to him after the comet went bust. Some fascinating stories. I thought I knew everything about the Amiga. I thought, I thought no one knows more than me. Then I started researching it. Thankfully, or well, unthankfully, it was COVID, but thankfully I had time to do it. <laughs> so when I researched, I found so much more information. Yeah, I, I was really, really impressed that, that you know, everyone thinks outside the Amiga community that the Amiga, could, the Amiga is a footnote in the history, multi, multitasking, that's it. And that we're all Macs and, actually, we're all PCs, Macs and a few other things. Uh, when I was writing the trilogy, I, I came to realize that just like the old uh, Monty Python, <laughs> we're not dead yet. <laughs> In fact, we're very much still alive. Okay? <laughs> I'm getting better. <laughs> but to many Amigans, there can be only one. <laughs> It's a classic Amiga uh, with a 68K CPU, curated by Commodore, uh, running Amiga OS. And that's it. There's the, there's the classic Amiga OS family. And, you know, it's quite funny because, you know, th that's where a purist, a true Amiga purist feels. Uh, and there's no doubt uh, we have kept our Amigas alive. Uh, this was uh, an Amiga uh, I saw at, uh, at Ami Party in Poland, a Super Bonio's A4000 tower, it had everything in it. I mean, it, was, it really was fantastic. I don't think I've seen a better tower. Now there's a challenge, right? I'm sure there's a challenge. <laughs> Make a better tower. <laughs> um, but, yeah, the, what, what was it set? What set the Amiga apart? Why are we still here? Well, one, we're crazy, we know that, right? <laughs> Two, most of us are all white males, as we found out last night, right? Uh, if you're here last night, you're, well, this morning, you're not, right? Uh, I apologize to the lovely ladies in the room, but that was a comment made uh, back in 1998. Yeah, well, uh, uh, and I, I can see hey, some, of the, some of the, the founders have been here for 28 years, so congratulations. So the, the, it's definitely not dead yet, right? And there's, there's only one, apparently. But what's kept Amiga alive? What's kept Amiga, uh, Amiga 68K, Amiga OS alive? And it has to be, it has to be said, it's software emulation. And the, the development of UAE uh, back in, oh, I'm trying to think what year that was, back in 86, was it? 96, 96, sorry. Um, it's, it, is, it was to prove that you could emulate the Amiga's custom, custom ship sets with emulation. And no one thought you could do that. And it, they produced UAE, the unusable Amiga emulator. But then it, became, then it improved. And, and, and the best one of all, and still developed probably, is WinUAE for Windows. But there are, there are emulations for, you know, for everything, really. Uh, UAE for all was uh, another develop another uh, uh, emulator that was created, but there's so many, right? So many out there. Uh, the thing is about, and I should have gone back on this because that's one I quite like. Uh, there's an old British sitcom, right, which says, you know, uh, I've only I've only had this broom for 20 years. I've changed the head 15 times and the handle 14 times. But it's the same room. <laughs> so we classic Amigans tend to do that on our computers. Yeah. We have all manner of upgrades in there. I mean, and sometimes you even replace the motherboard. And my own Amiga 2000, my first Amiga, went, suffered death by Varta. So, <laughs> so I, I have actually a, a, an Amiga 2000 that has a new case. I've replaced the motherboard. Uh, is it the same machine? Well, of course it is. Yeah. <laughs> in my mind it is <laughs> and, and we do add so many little additions to our makers and you walk around the show and you see all these wonderful things being developed I mean it's amazing the stuff that's being developed and it makes me really proud to be an Amiga a crazy Amiga right? so because we had good emulation uh, of the Amiga chipset it led to workbench distributions the first two, two early ones were Amiga in a Box. Did anyone remember that? Yeah. Uh, and then 
and then, uh, uh, oh, what was the other one? Lever in a box, and I can't remember the name now. No, no, before that. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, you know, oh yeah, Blood which is Classic Amiga. So a Classic Amiga, four Amigas. Amiga in a box was for emulated Amigas. But that led to the, I call it the Super Workbench Distribution. So the first one was Amigasys back in 2005. Followed quite soon by Amikit. And we've got an Amikit person here today. Amikit was, uh, while well, Amigasys stopped development about 2012, it's been picked up again by... Uh, by uh, uh, Amiga Kit. <laughs> Amiga Kit, Amiga Kit, always confuses me this. It picked up again by Amiga Kit and has been redeveloped. Whereas uh, the Amiga Kit, Amiga Kit, sorry, Amiga Kit is still developed, the latest version is version 12. It's now a paid version, unfortunately, but the, the Amiga Kit 10 is still free and you can download it. Yep. So, and it's, it is a really good uh, system, really nice. If you, if you want to try your emulation on a, a PC, or a Mac, or a, whatever else it runs on, a vampire, it runs on a number of things. <laughs> there was a <laughs> AROS, which is a not, a, a not an Amiga operating system. It's now, it was AOS back in 2003. It became AROS in 2005 because of, uh, I think it was Aaron Digula, if I can't pronounce his name right, but never mind. And it, it, it is a community effort of developers to create an alternative Amiga operating system because at the time they were concerned that Commodore were going bust. They were right, I guess. They were right. <laughs> yeah. And they were worried that the, the future of the Amiga OS would disappear. So they kept working on Amiga OS. And, and over the years, you know, the first one was Amiga a AROS Max, which was a, a distribution, that built like a Linux distribution, to show the, what the best of, of AROS could offer. Uh, Better ones, oh sorry, better ones, that's not fair to say that. Uh, more improved ones, VMware AROS, which is a really strange title, which was re renamed Icarus, De Icarus Desktop, and that's still developed. The last one was out, I think, two years ago. Uh, there's been others, Aspire OS, AROS 1XE, Tiny AROS, but you can be sure that Amiga developers, AROS developers, are developing AROS. They continue to develop AROS, it's a very active community. <coughs> Uh, that's led to uh, people creating their own AROS hardware. Well, they've used their own hardware and do-it-yourself AROS systems. Of course, what happens from then, you get people think, well, we can make some money out of this, we'll create AROS computers, and we can sell them. And I think the first, both in the same year, was uh, uh, Stephen Jones of uh, the Checkmate Digital mm -hmm. Cases. Uh, he created the iMika. The way he said it, because he's from North London, it tried to sound like Amiga. So, <laughs> so you know, fortunately, the uh, patent lawyers can't understand London accents, so it's not a problem, right? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, anyway, so he did produce a number of uh, iMikas, like the Silent, the Pro. Uh, he didn't sell many, you know, it was, and he doesn't do that anymore, right? The other one was uh, Pascal Papara, a German developer, who created Ares One, which was a, well, the iMika was a small, uh, I Intel board, the uh, Ares one was a big, beefy tower, uh, multi-booting uh, multi with uh, Linux and uh, Eros. The Amica was multi-booting again with Linux and Eros, uh, and Eros or Icarus desktop. Uh, the Eros one is still available to buy. Uh, the last version was in 2021, and it's supplied with Amiga Forever and crypto mining software. Well, so yeah, so Pascal has gone another route. Uh, he's trying to uh, cr create uh, crypt. Yeah, you can mine by using his, his hardware. Fine. Armed and dangerous. Well, we all know about the, the rise of ARM-based hardware. Uh, that has led to a number of uh, emulators for Amiga OS. Surprise, surprise. UAE for ARM was created by the same guy that did UAE for all. Uh, and actually, he created it for another product called the Armiga. And that's another <laughs> the Armiga, right? And it's no longer produced, but it was like a, a disk drive with the emulator. You put in your, your floppy disk and would run this, the, the game. That was the idea. It was one of the first FPGA type uh, devices out there, the size of a single floppy disk drive. Yeah. 
So, you were here for Arm, Ami Berry, Ambien, Pi Amiga, I'm sure there's loads more, because they yeah. keep coming up every day. And so there's the Arm Amiga, there it is, you can see uh, the, the floppy disk side was the other side, you put the, the thing in. Uh, it's, it's given rise to the A500 Mini from Retro Games, uh, which is uh, a, a stylized, miniaturized Amiga 500 case uh, with ARM-based hardware inside, powered by Amiberry. They don't say it's powered by Amiberry, but it's powered by Amiberry. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it comes uh, bundled with 25 games, you can buy this today. Uh, it, as sold, it, you, can't have a, you don't get access to the underlying operating system, but there are clever people that uh, create a thing called a Mini Mega, which is an OS you can put on it, which is basically <laughs> Mega OS. Which yeah, is, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so it's good, right? Uh, and of course, the 600 GS from uh, Amiga Kit, which you can buy over there. It's uh, probably a, a more fully featured uh, device, again based on ARM. It's uh, Ami Berry is the emulator. It's uh, Ami Bench on top. It includes some Eros components and a number of uh, components from uh, Aeon's OS4 software recompiled. And uh, it's a uh, the, it's a pretty good, good, pretty good product. You can go online with it. It does support Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and all those things. Okay, but my pride and joy, because <laughs> I'm biased, uh, uh, is the next generation. Right now, a little bit of history lesson to get us to where we get to. You see, you need to understand this. Uh, most you do because you're all nuts like me, but you know some people don't. So it's nice to tell the story. Next generation power PC. Well, this got, this dates back to. Uh, to David telling his stories today, you know, that there was a move towards PowerPC accelerators by Phase 5, uh, Commodore go bust, uh, Phase 5 visualizer powered PPC Amiga future, uh, Amiga, Amiga technologies visualizer powered PC off software future using hardware developed by people like Phase 5, SCOM go bust, Amiga technology disappears, PIOS comes out. Trying to create the next Power PC Amiga. Yeah. Same time, Phase Five had this dream of a Power PC Amiga. They compete on the forums, but they're competing because they both want to be win the hearts and minds of of us, right? Uh, problems with who owns the code? Can you get a license? Pius moves to supporting uh, creating Mac clones, yeah. very successfully creating Mac clones. Uh, Eventually, unfortunately, Phase 5s go bust. Everyone knows that, they went bust. Yeah. My, uh, my Phase 5 accelerator went belly up two days before they went bust. I called the, <laughs> I called the, de I called the dealer God. in the UK, he said, oh, send it to Phase 5. I posted it to Phase 5 the next day. The next day, Phase 5 went bust. I never saw it again. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, these are the stories that we, we love to tell because it's horrible. <laughs> uh, so, what we got was the, the, the team at Phase 5 uh, had been working on a, uh, a software and hardware and, and they thought, well, okay, we've done this work, let's create our own new PowerPC device. We can't call it Amiga, but we'll call it something else. And that's how the Pegasus 1 came about. So you've got uh, the X Phase 5 boys, B plan, some of the hardware people, and the Morphos team, which were the software people for Phase 5, really, and they create the Pegasus 1 with funding from Genesee. Right? Shortly afterwards, uh, the, offi the official, inverted commas, uh, offering from the new Amiga company, which had been formed after uh, Gateway sold uh, the Amiga, or licensed the Amiga rights and sold the name yeah. to another company. Right, called Amiga Inc. Bill McHugh and Felicity Moss. So there you are, you get two competing products. We had no Amigas for about five years, six years, yeah. and suddenly two come along at the same time. It's a bit like buses really, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, over the next few years, Genesee produced the... Uh, they both had problems, by the way. Yeah. They both yeah. used my technology, like... Uh, 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 Artisha uh, uh, S Northbridge, which had real issues, and I would say uh, Genesee 
B plan solved it by uh, the, the April <coughs> fixes, whereas uh, unfortunately uh, ITEC, who are using reference boards from May, uh, Terran Power PC reference boards, modified for, for us, for the, for the Amiga. Uh, <coughs> it never really solved the problem on, the, on its Amiga, Amiga ones, and uh, you, you solved it by putting in external cards and ignoring the on, on, on board a DMA because it just didn't work. Mm. Yeah. So the next couple of years we've got uh, the Effica from uh, Gen C B plan and you've got the uh, A1XE and the uh, Micro A1C. Uh, A1XE had the same problems with really as the first one. The uh, uh, Micro one, Micro A1C didn't, but it still was limited and wasn't perfect. Again, it was a reference board from my electronics. But what it did do, it led to the development of two PowerPC, competitive PowerPC uh, operating systems, which were vying for the hearts and minds of us, the Amiga people. Morph OS uh, and Amiga OS 4. Morph OS, the last version was released a couple of years ago. It was Morph OS 2. Sorry, Morph OS. I'm going to find the number. Yeah, thank you. 318. And it's a very nice operating system. If you haven't tried it, it's worth trying. Uh, OS 4 was the last one in 2020. Uh, and Update 3 is currently being worked on at the moment. Don't know when it's going to be released. Uh, but two very nice PowerPC operating systems. When you use them, you feel like you're using Amiga. It's really yeah. smooth, it's nice, it's clean, and, and it's. And I could go on all day about PowerPC, but never mind, I won't. Um, <laughs> That led to iTech and Genesi deserted the, sorry, left, I would say deserted, left the, uh, the Amiga market probably 2005, 2006, and it was left to other people to fill the void. The first was a company called uh, A-Cube um, in Italy. They formed a company just to create the SAM 440, and they brought out several models over the, over the years, the 440 uh, EP, the SAM Flex, so 440 Flex, uh, and the SAM 460EX. You can still buy the SAM 460EX. Sometimes it's marketed as the Amiga 1 500, uh, but I don't think the current version is. Uh, some stupid idiot decided to fund PowerPC motherboards. Uh, Matthew, I think it was. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, there's been a, a, a series of motherboards from Aeon Technology, the first one was the Amiga 1X1000, 2010, <laughs> started, <laughs> released in 2000, beginning of 2012. The X1000, uh, sorry, the X5020, X5040, and the more recent A1222+, Plus, which we had some to sell, but they got sold, so sorry. Uh, Aeon also creates its own uh, 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 software to enhance the, the experience of OS4, which includes drivers, utilities, you name it, it's, it's a really uh, big package. Uh, Linux port. I'm going to go to that. <laughs> yeah. uh, and it, uh, it also, uh, you don't have a stride there, Alex. <laughs> yeah, so enhances the current version is 2.2, 2.3 in the works, being beta tested. All this hardware it, uh, supports Linux. Uh, and because uh, we have great volunteers, like we all have in the Amiga world, uh, the developers, especially a guy called Christian Sigotsky, makes sure that our hardware is supported by the mainstream Linux kernel. So every kernel that comes out supports our X1000s and X5000s. So it's brilliant. And the Linux people kick out kernels like, it's mad. <laughs> it is. It, I mean, it's, as soon as they pick one out, it's next one. Yeah. Yeah, it never stops. Send it the clones, right. <laughs> uh, clones. Now, a little bit of history. You all know it really, but a little bit of history. In 2005, Dennis van Weeren, a uh, Dutch Amiga enthusiast, actually embarked on a project to recreate the Amiga's custom chips in FPGA. Yep. No one thought it could be done. And when he announced it, I think it was on Amiga.org, uh, they, they, no one believed him. They were like calling him a liar, which is strange. So he, he actually produced pictures and they thought they were fake. You know. We're very trusting in the Amiga computer. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but eventually, at a, a, one of the, um, the Dutch uh, meetups, he had his prototypes. 
And it was this thing, a whole bunch of stuff he bought, things he built, put them together, and that was his first Amiga, yeah. FPGA. Uh, eventually, he smartened it up and he came up with a design like that, the Minimeek version 1, and he open sourced it. Anyone could build it. Yeah. He, he, it was really good. Anyone could do it, right? Uh, and a few companies picked it up and produced uh, the version 1.1, which is the version that was released. And the first company to uh, actually produce the Minimeek version 1.1 was A Cube. But others have done it since. Mm -hmm. And uh, these two people, you saw one today. That's Ian Schoenfeld on the on the on your right, and that's uh, Dennis Van Veer Van Veeren on the left. Dennis is, no longer works on uh, uh, Amigas, but his FPGA work on the Amiga led to the work he does now his, it, for the company he works for. So it's it's amazing how this thing works out. And that was in a show in. This is really interesting because that was a show in Italy where uh, they were invited, he was invited to go and present his mini me prototype yeah. for an award, you know, maybe get an award. He didn't win the award, something else won. But that was the first time that Jens Schoenfeld found out that Dennis had a mini me. Yeah. And Dennis was creating his own FPGAs. He was trying to recreate the whole of the Amiga chipset in FPGA, but really controlled based on all the time he's doing it really accurately. Uh, he, and that was in the Clone A. Uh, we had C1 first, then Clone A. Uh, it, never re it never was realized, except he, it did. The Turbo Chameleon pro product that came out much later was based on that early work. Uh, and when he gave his presentation today, that was, I was asking what's happening to that work he's doing with the, the, the custom chipset. Yeah. Yeah. But two, I mean, Jens does a lot more than that. He does accelerators, he does graphics, he does, he does everything. So he, he's been a, as he said, he started his business when Commodore went bust. What timing, right? <laughs> but Minimix evolved. There was a Swedish guy called uh, Peter Zedlina. Uh, he decided to create a mini ITX version of the Minimix and add lots of new features. He even created a mini Minimix. <laughs> uh, but unfortunately, uh, he probably wasn't, he was probably a student, I just come out of university, he wasn't married, he probably found girls and uh, work, and then he, he, he stopped doing the work. But it was a really nice phase in the development of Minimig to prove that you can actually really develop and expand it. There's another crazy guy up in Canada who has gone even one further with Minimig, and he's, he, he started making Minimig 1.1s, he bought the machinery to make it all himself. To, <coughs> Uh, pick and uh, place machine, and he started working on other things in the, for the classic community. Um, he made uh, re Amiga boards for the 1200 and other Amiga components. And in last uh, two years ago, he came out with version 1.9, beautiful little uh, machine. His last version is uh, Mini Amiga version 1.98 ITX. <laughs> now I have to read this one because I want to. I never know this one. It's not in the book. This one. Uh, it got a DIP64 sockets, ARM controller, PyStorm compatibility, performance similar to an A600 with CPU speeds up to 40. Oh, that's the other one, sorry. Uh, it's a six layer gold plated PCB, blah, 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 6800, near 60 megahertz. Again, it's PyStorm, uh, kickstart caching, and can support the terrible fire accelerators. Well done. Uh, and it's later, the ITX version that includes uh, uh, Wi Fi headers, wireless connectivity to the Minimi in the ecosystem. So it's really developing these things. And you can buy these, they are available to buy. So if you want a, a, an advanced classic computer running Amiga OS Classic and having wireline connect, connectivity without having your old Amiga hardware, you can do it today. But the, the ones that really have caught the imagination with most Amigans over the years, and, and other games players, are the, the Mist and Misters. So I'd straight that Mist and Misters. Uh, uh, so Till Harburn, uh, Harbour, uh, created the Mist, and he was actually an ST. Uh, sorry, Chris, he was an ST guy. Uh, uh, first. Uh, <laughs> so he created the Mist. It was supposed to be ST for ST. Uh, but eventually, uh, he, he found it easier to emulate the Amiga. So he did that first, and he did the ST afterwards. But now this, this 
is available today to buy from various, again it's open sourced, so other, you, other people make it, and you can, you can uh, emulate almost any computer on it, any retro computer or, yeah, it's crazy, it really is crazy. Uh, Alex Mel Melnikov, a Russian, went one further with the Mister. They were both inspired by the Mini Mig. It was, they were inspired by the Mini Mig, and and this one is uh, it's based on a uh, DE Nano 10, I guess. Is that the right word? Uh, but you can add lots of other things to it and get a little tower like that. Again, it's open source. You can do it yourself. But a number of uh, small manufacturers, or small companies, have created their own. And you, you can see four or five companies selling these all around the world at various price points, depending on how many levels you want there, how much support you want. But really, really good. And I, there's, I don't think I saw any misters or mists at the show today. Yeah, one, okay, one. good. I, I did see one of Ranko's boards, one of the 1.9 minis, mini mix. Yes. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Uh, of course, you know, we, the, the one that uh, is quite interesting as well, it, again, someone else wanted to recreate all the Amiga custom chips in FPGA and it started a lot earlier. And uh, he wanted to create a native Amiga computer called uh, Natami. So, unfortunately, it never, it never came to fruition, but it created a l and the guy's name was... Come on, what was the guy's name? Anyone know? I should know, but I don't, so there we are. <laughs> I was hoping for a fail. <laughs> Thomas Hirsch, that was the guy, Thomas Hirsch. And he actually met a bunch of guys, he was typical Amiga, and he loved the Amiga, he wanted to recreate the Amiga. He started working for IBM uh, in the Power PC division. So with, uh, and he met another three or four people who were all Amiga freaks in the Power PC division. They didn't know this, but at lunchtime they'd have lunch together and start talking about real computers, the Amiga. So they're, so they're working on the, you know, the really powerful PowerPC processors, CPUs, for IBM. They're all talking about Amigas, how wonderful it was and how much better it is. Anyway, they decided to do the native Amiga and they came, they came across with clones and if, from this the Apollo group evolved. The, the Natomy never got commercial, it was a number of prototypes. It was all funded by Thomas Hirsch, when he decided that, look, I've got a life, I've got a family, I can't keep putting money into this, it all stopped. So, yeah. But it did lead to an association with uh, um, uh, Ma Meister Ma Mastro Mastrovich, 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 uh, who took the lead with uh, developing a vampire accelerator. It was the first FPG accelerator for A600. And he, had, he wasn't an Amiga, and he knew nothing about the Amiga. But he got a whole, probably because it was in Bosnia, he had a whole bunch of A600s, and he started <laughs> wrecking them, <laughs> trying to create an FPG accelerator. And it, it took him three years, and he eventually did create the fastest uh, 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 68K FPG accelerator in the world at the time. Right. But uh, he never really got over some of the problems. Uh, when the Natomir group disbanded, they, they created the, uh, the CPU in FPGA, and they called it 68050. And then they did a few twe tweaks, and they called it 68080. But basically, uh, the FPGA of the, of the 68K CPU. They worked together with um, uh, Master, and created Vampire V2 uh, with bigger FPGAs and chips on board and, and work together. So that you've got a whole bunch of Vampire V2 accelerators for the 5000, the 1200, for the 600, all based on uh, the original concept and idea of uh, Masterovic. But with the CPU, FPA G CPU based on the, the Apollo CPU. That, that led to the Vampire V4 standalone. Is any here today? No, Vampire V4. Uh, uh, no? Uh, okay. There's one in the raffle, right? There's one, there's one in the raffle, okay. Uh, which is a very small, self-contained... Uh, well, it's called a Vampire V2. It's obviously an Amiga clone. Um, 
and some V4 accelerators for the A500, 1000, 2000, and the 1200. So these are accelerators based on the the uh, the Apollo FPGA core, their 68080 CPU. Unfortunately, uh, 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 after that, uh, Master decided to focus on Vampire V2s independently. Uh, while the Apollo team released V4 accelerators and for the Amiga and 68K machines, they went their separate ways. It wasn't a happy parting, uh, but uh, they both contribute to the industry and to the Amiga scene, so I'm not going to say any more about that. What's been a real bonus for Amigans is, the, is, is crowdfunding. And a, a number of Amigans have used crowdfunding to uh, fund their projects, to take the risk out of funding their projects. Matthew, we could do that. Uh, <laughs> Crowdfunding has become an essential tool for Amiga community, tapping into the, the platforms like Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Amiga retro computing enthusiasts have successfully launched uh, and funded a, a variety of hardware and software products. Cases, keyboards, retro consoles, games, books, they've all benefited from the trend of using uh, um, crowdfunding. Bill Bazzari's 2015 Amiga 30th celebrations, banquet and the show, was, was partly or mainly funded by crowdfunding, by Kickstarter. Is that correct, Bill? Yes, sir. Yep. Uh, even David Pleasance used Kickstarter to fund the first volume of Vampire's book. He thought it was going to be one volume. <laughs> For <laughs> volume one of the Vampire's book. It, the rest was uh, from sales. There are only too many, there's too many community products to talk about. I've walked around now, there's enough I've seen today for another book. But I'm not writing it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> He'll write it. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it. He'll write it. Yeah. So, and not only that, we've got people recreating classic Amiga boards. Uh, and you know, there's a group of people that, that, that they go to the, they get a board, have it sanded down, and they recreate all the traces and re get rebuilt up and spend lots of money doing it. And then they, get, they put it open source and yeah. companies then build them, and, or you can build it yourself, it's by the board, I couldn't do that because I haven't got the skill, but you, the companies that will sell you a, a new Amiga 4000 motherboard, or a new 500 board. And the, uh, many, many, many innovators are working to do that. Uh, one of the first was uh, Paul Resendez, is Paul here? Yay, Yay Paul! Yay, He got some funding, but probably funded m most of it himself to get, recreate the A4000 board. And you, you know, there are people making A4000s, new A4000s, from the boards that he created. Well done, Paul. Uh, uh, Chuck, uh, John Hurtle, he does a lot of uh, re Amiga boards uh, for, the, for the 3000, for the, well, oh, I can't remember, there's lots of them anyway. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's done loads, and, and for A360. Accelerate everything he's done. This group's crazy. And then you've got Floppy. I couldn't find his name. Even in the book, he's Floppy 209. I hope, I hope he's a, not a medical condition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, it's amazing what the people are doing. And, and they all open source them, which is the great thing about it. Uh, and allows other people to build them, either buy a built, a built system or create themselves. And there's some of the re Amiga boards there. There's a 4,000 there, I guess. 2,000. Is that 3,000? And a 1,200? Yeah, anyway, whatever. Re Amiga boards. Brand new Amiga boards. It's not new. I mean, there's a guy in, uh, uh, in Spain, um, Mr. Fidis, who uh, recreated the uh, Amiga 1000 uh, with help from Eduardo uh, uh, Arana. Arana? Arana? What's his name? Someone tell me. Edu. Edu. Yeah, Thank you. Around. Thank you. And they recreated it, but they tend to keep it within their club. So they, they fund it in their club, and if there's any excess, they'll sell it all around the world. But generally, it stays within their club. But, you know, creating new boards is not new, really. There was the Phoenix board for the, for the A1000 way back. Uh, but it is good that we're doing that. And people are creating new, uh, new accelerators. They're also doing that. 
One that I quite, and I can't mention everyone because there's just too many, right? But one I quite like is the, uh, the three, I call them the three sisters. Way back in, in, in Switzerland, uh, an anonymous Mr. A, who doesn't like publicity, started developing a, a living room board that would be small and would be wife or partner friendly. <laughs> or husband and partner friendly, I'm trying to be, you know, on both sides. Uh, and so he created what was called the Amy ITX, which was an ITX version, or a, a modern ITX version of an Amiga using custom chipsets. So, and it includes accelerators, uh, it includes um, uh, Wi-Fi, uh, internet, includes uh, RAM, all these things you put onto it. And I thought that was it. And then he refined it and created Denise, <coughs> an improved version. I just found out a couple of weeks back he created a Lisa, a new version of it. Uh, and these are all small runs of boards for their group, for their team, uh, which people can buy uh, when they have enough you know, uh, orders in. I think I funded the Denise one. I helped to fund that one because I, I was really keen on, on you know, what they were doing. I thought it was really good to create a mini ITX motherboard, modern Amiga motherboard, but using all the old stuff. It was great. I thought it was really good. So, but the thing is, there's so many things. Oh, I can't, I can't miss out the Pi Storm, which is a, which has taken the media community by storm. The classic media community loves the Pi Storm. If you don't know what it is, it's basically a carrier board. <coughs> you remove the CPU, you put the carrier board in the CPU place, and you put a Raspberry Pi on top, and it gives you all the features of the Raspberry Pi. Access the accelerator, but it's got so many other things. So, and the software is developing all the time. So this is selling, I mean, is this one of your most popular? Definitely, yeah. Definitely, yeah. yeah, PyStorm. And again, he open sourced it. So people can create their own pipe, their own carrier boards, PyStorm carrier boards, for, you know, and sell them. Because not everyone can solder. I certainly can't solder to that level, sorry. But we do a world of innovation. I mean, the EMEA community continues to innovate with projects like multifunctional ZZ9000 graphics card, which is more than a graphics card, as we know. It's got everything on it. Um, it's from an M MNT in Germany. The arm based Buffy dropping board, uh, for replacement for uh, accelerator for a CPU uh, by Randy Cousins. A range of open source terrible fire accelerators from Stephen Leary. Uh, CS Labs warp engine accelerators for the Amiga 500 and 1200. There's him and Michael Spindler's Akiko 32 Portable Classic Amiga laptop. Uh, and Hans de Reuter's A1282 uh, Do It Yourself laptop. There's just so many things going on, so many developments that it's hard to keep up, it really is. Uh, when I sat down to plan this talk, you know, I, I said it turned, it turned quickly into a really long presentation. I've tried to keep it as short as possible. There's just so much happening in, the, in our Amiga world, it's hard to keep up. So I'm definitely not writing another book because it's too much, too difficult, there's too much going on. If you're curious to know all the amazing developments of people shaping our Amiga community, the Vultures of Vampires trilogy, and this is a really, not, not a, a plug, plug for the book, it's more about the, the information in there that I managed to put together is a real resource of information, it's worth having just for that. So what is an Amiga in 2020? After all that, what is an Amiga, right? I think Harrison had it right. It still is an Amiga world, right? Uh, is it a soup, but is it a souped up 68K running classic Amiga OS? Or is it a custom built next generation Power PC machine? <laughs> running Amiga OS 4 or Morph OS. Maybe it's an Eros powered PC or a cycle accurate liquid, liquid silicon FBGA clone. Could it be a 68K emulation on ARM or Windows? One thing's for clear, talented Amigans are still pushing the platform forward, developing new hardware and software for our beloved machine. Whether it's a classic 68K inspired vampire board, community driven product, product, projects like Denise or Lisa, or powerful power PC systems from Aeon or Acube, the, the Amiga spirit endures in all its forms. But the Amiga is more than hardware and software, or even legal disputes and IP challenges. 
is the collective passion of the community, enthusiasts, developers, companies, who continue to pour time, energy and funds in keeping the Amiga dream alive. What became as a, as a computer platform has evolved into a broader movement, embracing classic enthusiasts, next generation hardware developers, software innovators and a community that remains deeply passionate and, and, and inventive. In 2024, the Amiga seems more vibrant, diverse and complex than ever. A testament to its enduring legacy and the commitment of its community. Ultimately, what defines an Amiga today isn't just the technology. It's the enduring, uh, it's the enduring legacy, it's the, sorry, it's the enduring spirit, it's spirit of the users, the dedicated developers and the entire community. We, the Amiga enthusiasts, are the heart of what makes Amiga so great. We are Amiga. Thank you. Thank you very much. We really appreciate your commitments, and uh, always have, and uh, your participation in our gathering here every year. Uh, and I think um, you, you and Matthew and several, many of you, uh, are our supporters and uh, the reason why we are still here. You know, it, it, the idea originally in 1998, our two Amiga stores in Sacramento had just closed. And uh, the club said, John Zacharias and the committee said, well, let's, let's do a show and have a big Amiga store every year. So, uh, and we were really primed for somebody to come along and, you know, buy it and make another company and keep on trucking. Well, we kept on trucking. <laughs> <laughs> hasn't been because of a company, though. It's been because of all of us. So thank you very much. Uh, and we'll see you at the show tomorrow and at the party tonight, which I think, is it in this room? I think probably yeah. this room. This room, okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think they get upset with so many people at the front. Oh, well, that's true, because they couldn't talk on the phone at midnight. So, thank you very much, uh, and uh, have a good party. I'll be there too, and see you tomorrow for the show.